Right, good evening everyone. Uh, uh, this is after a long day's work, it's Peter here and uh, you know it'd be nice to, we can go through everything slowly and uh, it's nice to have uh, all the attendees out there at the moment. As I said or as uh, Pete said, um, if there's any questions don't hesitate, just email or just use the question bar and uh, we'll try and get through them. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been another long day at work so it's just uh, enjoy ourselves. Thanks a lot. Right, let me just turn this. We're just going to go straight into the presentation now. And uh, first of all, um, I'd like to just sort of, oops, sorry. Oh, let me just get that. Okay. Okay, there we go. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, just to introduce myself, I've been placing dental implants. I work here in uh, West London in Kensington. And uh, I've been placing impl dental implants since 1990, 91, and uh, basically been involved since the late 80s. So I've seen many areas change and many things happen. And uh, I was the uh, director of education of the ADI, so been helping and trying to help with learning and teaching and looking at different protocols and different ideas over the years on how to improve things. Um, and it's been quite exciting, obviously, the development of Ethos to an award-winning uh, company, which has now the, uh, a good market share in the UK, and we're growing worldwide. So tonight, actually, we're going to be talking more about the published protocol that I published with MINAS in uh, 2015. And this is a protocol which I've essentially used for all of my implant uh, patients since about 2003, 2002, late 2002. And so I've done sort of thousands of cases over this period of time. And so we've actually managed to develop a, a real nice consistency where we're getting in the 99% in the success rate preloading. Uh, and it, it's all about us actually doing less surgery and understanding biology. So this is what tonight's going to be, is we're going to really more talk about the protocol. I'm only going to show cases using the protocol. Yes, we use them in ethos in many different areas, from sinuses to perio to um, cases where we're doing apisectomies to a number of things, but I'm not going to include uh, all of those tonight. We're going to stick very religiously to the protocol because the protocol was uh, something that I was doing way before I even thought of doing ethos. I was working for numerous different companies and we'll go through that. Right, it, it's a straightforward one. I know we can even call it simplified. I know we all hate that word, simplified protocol. What does simplified mean? Uh, and it just means that it's essentially making our life a little easier. And if it makes our life easier and the patient's life easier, then we've achieved something. As I said, I've been doing it for 16 years, probably about five and a half, over five and a half thousand cases I've followed this protocol. This protocol works on a simple, logic idea of that post extraction we leave it for four weeks well why does no one else say this why does everyone say i think danny boost is delayed is about eight weeks or or we can do immediate or whatever well we look at this logically rather than any other reason which a company may uh, be funding something for and the logic is is that when we extract it that three to four week period is the soft tissue healing period. So then we just get soft tissue closure. Now this, this depends a lot on, on your ability and your skills at dealing with soft tissue. And this is the key to things. How can, how can you do the surgery? How well can you suit your soft tissue? How can you deal with frail tissue? It's about lifting a recently extracted site, lifting the periosteum without damaging uh, the tissue and damaging the soft tissue. Why do we look at before before five weeks? Well, all the research by Schropp uh, and um, and others has shown that the real hard tissue modeling starts at about five weeks. This modeling can be really case dependent, dependent on uh, whether it was infection, dependent on the site, dependent on host physiology. Then we load at 10 to 12 weeks. I use 10 as a standard, but again, it's better to start off loading at 12 weeks um, I often use Ostel in the sinus, I load at eight weeks. So it, it varies as to, um, you may have some patients have a far better healing than other patients. So this is something we've got to look into. 
and it's really important that we we do keep looking into this sorry i'm just having another problem again right um we've written quite a lot this is just some of the papers some of the research and we've written in many different languages we've written it in um, greek italian german french uh, and so we've published quite extensively and try to help by having it in different languages if you look at the ethos website you can probably find something of value to in, uh, read under under references i'm going to go straight back when i start this is a case i did in like 2003 2004 and initially in those days we were initially mixing our own materials and then we basically used products from an orthopedic company and they were trying to spend something off into dentistry the ideology behind this was they thought there was more to the market the problem really is uh, the dental market is not really of great interest to the major researching, major medical companies, orthopedics and spinal companies, where they're getting paid a lot of money to develop products uh, that are taken more seriously with higher amounts spent in research. Uh, the dental market has unfortunately never really made sense. Um, uh, so we've, we've been denied a lot of thoughts and ideas. But going all the way back to this case, you can see there's an old Intos implant, difficult implants to place, uh, just straight cylinders. Um, but this is what we had uh, in, in the days gone by, and this was more uh, a tissue level, supercrestal placement. But right from this early day, and messy old Fogos, you can see that we've retained the papillae, kept a small flap, haven't raised it too far, no real releasing flaps, and we regenerate without the use of a membrane. So this is a, a big question. Everyone thinks because we're not using a membrane, we're not following the basic principles. Yes, the actual membrane is built in these materials. So the calcium sulfate element, if you look at the graft on the right hand side, you'll see that the graft is stable and it's stabilized by calcium sulfate. This is what we're gonna go into. So this is a really initial phase using a, a, an old orthopedic product. And here it is 12 years later. And if we notice, we can see that there's no loss of volume. When you look at it against the other central, this is after 12 years loading. We do not need a foreign HA to keep the profile. This is something we've known for 120 years. Here it is 14 layers loaded. And you can see we've lost no bone, we've lost no profile, the case looks good. Yes, the adjacent central is now probably going to be needed to be uh, dealt with after 16 years he, he phoned me up the other day saying he had a problem but we've known for this for many years from 1892 with wolf's law that if we keep bone in function the bone will stay in place and if the bone stays in place we will maintain the profile we do not need to put foreign ha to keep profile if this was the case we would need foreign HA to stand up because our bones wouldn't wouldn't be able to stand up because somehow we feel that we would lose it. No, if we stand on our legs, we keep the long bones. If we didn't, the bone would remodel uh, would would model away, uh, remodel away. So this is something that uh, Julius Wolf brought out many years ago, and the the principle still exists. This is basic biology physiology. Why do we always place early? Now, this is a, a really important question I get asked a lot, and, and, and it's all comes down to this one research paper, which was in uh, Jomi in 2013, I think. And um, it's about the semiconductive nature of, TI, of titanium implants. And when we just place the implant, the implant alone leads to a significant higher bone metabolism in the initial phases. This thing sort of tails off to the point that there's no difference at four weeks or so. So this is why we like to load early as well. And this is why I'm talking about 10 week, eight week loading. Um, again, because what this does is creates a secondary spike in bone metabolism, which then leads to more bone forming uh, under this sort of functional remodeling. And this is the key to everything. It's all about angiogenesis. Now, if we look at this research, this is some research. I know it's a review, but it's a review of her research. It's Pamela Havovich, who's the preeminent uh, researcher in the medical world on calcium phosphates. And what we're looking here is calcium phosphates, angiogenesis, and implications in, in the advance of bone regeneration. Here, they're just talking about bone regeneration. They're not talking guided bone regeneration. They are doctors, okay? This is the important factor. 
And we've got to understand this. This is bone regeneration. We're going to go through this quite a little bit. And this is all down to blood vessels. As we always know, healing is due to oxygen. Oxygen is dependent on the blood supply to the site that needs to heal. And, and this is why I haven't used a traditional membrane. Therefore, I've possibly never done guided bone regeneration in my life because I never use a membrane. I use the miracle of nature, and that's called the periosteum. And there's a ton of research on the periosteum in medical uh, research. You don't have to worry. It's not just the blood supply and the oxygen. It's also uh, the stromal cell derived factors. These are induced by the periosteum. And this is the indication of healing to the bony side. Stromal cell derived factors are responsible for the arrival of mesenchymal cells, which will differentiate to osteoblasts and therefore regenerate and heal the bones. So we've got to look more at biology. And this is what we're going to go about. You know, when we look at guided or true bone re regeneration, as I say, I've probably never done guided bone regeneration in my life. So, and I've done thousands of graphs over a 28 year period. Um, I, I tend to do true bone regeneration, which is a more medical way of doing things. In other words, I want to return the host to what it was before. And only the body can do true bone regeneration. It doesn't matter what degree, what diploma I do. It doesn't matter if I become a, a diplomat or a fellow of the ITI. I still can't regenerate bone. Only the body can regenerate bone. It's simple. So when we're doing GBR, guided bone regeneration, where we're generally putting an HA or a xenograft, we're merely integrating foreign material into the host bone. This is not regeneration. This is GBR. And this is logical, and I look at it as biologic. So when we look at things, why true re bone regeneration? So I go back to just sort of looking at we Wikipedia. Regeneration of humans is the regrowth of lost tissue, and it's all done by the host in response to injury. This is what I want. When we look at uh, GBR, GBR is a, a new thing that's just come into Wikipedia. And, 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 I, and I agree, it's, it, it was probably Darwin or in, in, the, in the late 80s or the, who decided about that by placing a barrier membrane and creating an artificial space or putting in a, a, a filler, this is what it was. So I like guided bone, but I feel that the way I've always been working is along the lines of host regeneration, true bone regeneration. We'll talk about that. So, so I always like the idea of biology and understanding the basics. And the basics of biology and physiology are the important parts. These are the parts that we learned about before financial considerations came and affected the way we were a, taught and treated our patients. And I like education, but education is not merely about learning the facts. It's about training the mind to think. This is Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was rejected from Zurich University at his first, uh, because he didn't want to just learn what other people, he wanted to learn how to think. And I like this little slide about minds are like parachutes. You know what? Minds work really well when they open. So what we're going to do this evening is just open our minds, do a little bit of thinking, have a little bit of fun. Um, and as dentists, we like to use our hands. I know, uh, you know, this is, I do this every day. But what I'm trying to actually look at this evening is, is using host biology and try to actually work with host to get healing. Okay, we need a scaffold. Yeah, the guy's building a nice scaffold. And we, if we look at these products, they're nice big chunky bits. They're gonna stay there for the rest of the patient's life. And yes, it makes it easier to fill the hole or build the wall because they take up space. And if we look at them, they are just this, they are fillers, they are bricks, they just help us fill the hole. So when we end up with this, we end up with a wall. Is it easier to build with bricks? Hell yes, it is. But what we end up with is less bone, less host bone. And what we're doing is we're talking about living tissue. Living tissue is important because it needs to turn over. We're not placing the implant into a block of wood, we're placing it into a live tissue. So we need a higher percentage of bone. So if we're going to put all these fillers and bricks in there, we're getting a lower percentage of bone in all the research. The ideal would be to make a wall out of all bone. But as you know, even from building a cement wall, we need reinforcing, we probably need uh, supporting. 
So it is more difficult. Uh, and in a lot of ways, people often say, oh, putting a block is difficult. No, putting a block is easy because that's what we do. We cut it and we screw it. Building and regeneration, true regeneration, can be a lot more difficult, but it becomes a lot more easy when you actually do it a lot. So, you know, we look at little ideas here. I'm just using two, uh, two millimeter PDS sutures to do a way of tenting to hold the, the pressure of the, the soft tissue away whilst we graft underneath. So we're looking at a lot of novel ways and these sutures then bioabsorb by themselves. So there's no secondary suture, surgery. So we're looking at a lot of novel ways to overcome age old problems. And that's what we want. And that's what the patient wants because the patients come to you to be healed. So they want their own bone. And also what the patient does want is what the biology wants. This is what the body wants. So this involves basically preservation and host regeneration. So I was talking earlier about Lars and Lars, Lars Schropp uh, basically in 2003, as long ago as that, was talking about preservation and about placing the implant as early as possible to maintain uh, this, the residual host bind. So that's what we're going to talk about, preservation, re uh, regeneration. So we're going to work with the host regeneration to improve the outcomes with reduced or minimal surgery. The less surgery we do, the better outcome we're going to have. Look, it doesn't matter how good I became as a dentist. You know, I could never do what the body does. If you look at the liver, we take half the liver out. 21 days, it's regenerated that. You know, and the, and the doctors understand that. So as dentists, we probably think we could do a better job with our hands. But we've got to understand we're working with American and let's optimize that work. So, you know, developing materials and where I got to with Ethos was a really long road. I've worked with three or four companies. I've worked with, uh, you know, orthopedic companies, dental companies to optimize and to understand. But I was always being given the material by a scientist and said, you develop the protocol. No, I wanted to develop a material that suited the protocol I was already using. It made a lot more sense that way than going the other way. And this is what led to Ethos, uh, the material that I'd sort of spent a lot of time, actually the last five, six years prior to becoming on the, on the market, about developing and understanding. So this is a material that's developed by a hands-on clinician. This is not something that uh, someone has just made and then so, oh, well, you develop the protocol for it. Um, <clears throat> it was developed and in response to already having the protocol, unfortunately, we've gone on and done very nicely. And, and it seems to be, you know, getting a market and, and, and having a residence with people. So when we look at particulates, we're not going to look at blocks or anything. We don't have time. And we're looking at a, a simple protocol. The protocol requires us to put a particulate underneath to act as a scaffold. Now we look at this list, which was uh, published in Koya by Nicholas Lang and Ian Yeb. Yeah, you know, we love all those things. Osteoinductive, osteoconductive, biocompatible, totally replaced by bone. I, I love that. Um, appropriate resorption time. So as the material's resorption is replaced by bone, these are all things that are really exciting. And maintaining the graft volume, stability, and a satisfactory mechanic, no risk of disease. That's, you know, pretty important to the patient. And the only material I felt fitted into all of this was beta TCP. And we began to look further and understand beta TCP more. I loved using uh, allografts many years ago, but it was a real problem, you know. And this was my main influence for actually switching to synthetics was the fact that I was to cook uh, his body parts with stolen in New York. And every patient in the early 2000s used to come to me and say, oh, I hope you're not going to put Alice to cook in me. And it was a big thing here in England. And that's when I decided never to sort of really trust foreign materials because this was quite a, a blow. So that's why I looked in different directions. And, you know, we've got to the stage with ethos now with numerous studies. We've used histologists around the world with North America with uh, Harry Prasad and Heine Nagurski in Germany and here in the UK. And we're seeing a consistent outcome with 50% new bone at 10 weeks post-surgery and these are taken in the center of the course so this is the development of ethos has really helped my protocol and really helped what we're doing because we are actually managing to get an upregulation of the host response and this is what we're going to show you so 
calcium sulfate, it's only a small barrier function and it stabilizes the graft. So this is like having the equivalent of a membrane function, except it allows the real membrane to do the work, the periosteum. Now ethos is 65%, beta TCP, 35% calcium sulfate. What are the other benefits of calcium sulfate? It's biocompatible, stable, bacteria static, and we see great soft tissue healing, which I'll go into over it. And it bioabsorbs in about three to four weeks, depending on the base patient physiology. And when it bioabsorbs, it creates space for further vascular ingrowth, angiogen in which uh, neovascular ingrowth into the site. And this improves the angiogenesis, as well as when it breaks down and bioabsorbs, it's providing nutrients for the mineralization. So it's got so many benefits, but it's not that actually that important because it's the beta TCP that's the important part and how it's made. So when we look at it microscopically, uh, under under microscope, under a big, uh, we can see the shapes of the, the calcium sulfate. It just looks like little little flakes of uh, material. It looks great, actually, it's Star Wars-y. But when we've mixed it with, with the beta-TCP, on the left-hand side, you can see the way it naturally is, and you can see all the calcium sulfate as the fine bit. On the right-hand side, we've managed to wipe a lot of the calcium sulfate off to take the photograph where we can actually see the beta TCP particles underneath and the shape of the beta and how they lock together. Okay, so this is quite an interesting factor as well. We look at another one and we see the same thing. You see all the calcium sulfate. What the calcium sulfate is doing is stabilizing the graft for the initial three to four weeks until there is stability in the healed site. In, 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 and we look on the right hand side, you can see the beta TCP particles how they lock together and the spaces in between where the bone will start growing uh, as the calcium sulfate element by absorbs. How do we learn all about it? Well, this is the man, uh, Klaus de Kruert, who's uh, Emirate Professor of Eindhoven University. He's the man who basically understood everything about, uh, about calcium phosphates and he's written everything. Um, you know, and again, here he's saying that uh, well-known calcium phosphate, uh, guide to new bone formation form a tight bond with the original and then it forms away and therefore by definition they're osteoconductive but they're osteoinductive as well and we'll go through this osteoinductivity as we show you more slides later look the success to any graph material whether it be a xenograft or an allograft or even autogenous it all works on simple basics the basics of surgery and understanding biology. So we, we really have to try not to get too complicated. Let's try and think of the basics of what we're doing. Look, a major concern about graft materials is uh, what gets put in is the presence of residual particles. This is why in the protocol that we've had for 17 years and is published is that we always wanted the conceptual idea of returning the host back to host bone only without residual, unless we needed it for some extreme reason, which is once or twice a year. And it's because we're not doing woodwork. You know, I love the way at Zurich University, everyone measures every, every success is deemed by a set of calipers. It's not, it's living tissue. And as Horvath says, we cannot judge just about quantity. We cannot measure success by a set of calipers. We have to look at what we have in there. So without actually using histology or histomorphometry, it could be anything. And I love the way people show CBCT and they say, oh, look at all the new bone. Hey, no, you've got to show me histomorphometry and tell me what it is. Anyone can take an x-ray and say it's that. So when we look at the research, this uh, systematic review by Homle Wang, Homle Chan, shows that up to 23% less bone when xenographs were used and a 23% increase in bone uh, when we were using alloplasts. So this is what we want. This is logical. This is what my children would say, Dad, we want more bone. We don't want to put bricks in there because we're going to have less bone. So let's look a little bit at simplified regeneration protocol, you know, clinical perspective. All right, here it is. Nothing's changed in 70 years. Smaller flaps. Why do we want smaller flaps? Well, we don't want to destroy the blood supply to the healing site. We want to keep the site going. We want to keep the adjacent papillae. Why? Well, here's some research by Dennis Tarno as well uh, as some Italian researchers. And they showed, the Italian researchers showed, I just can't remember the names, that actually by sparing the papillae, we keep the blood 
to the critical piece of bone, which is the interproximal bone up against the adjacent teeth, and this helps hold the retain the papillae. So when we look at it here, we can see we've just placed the implant following the standard protocol, which is three weeks healing, raise the flare, clean the site, place the implant, graft with ethos over knees, stabilize the graft, suture closed. Ten weeks later, what have we got? Solid bone, uh, mainly host bone. All our research is showing it's 8 to 12 percent. At 10 weeks, it's 8 to 12 percent residual particles. This is all we want. We realized through Wolf, we don't need HA, we don't need a xenograft to stay for the rest of our life of our patient to maintain the profile. This is enough. And, our, and when people have put foreign material, they say, oh, it's bone. Well, is it? You know, otherwise this little guy's gonna be Batman. The only way to tell is histology, histomorphometry, and to do it in a scientific way. Not just looking at it and say, oh, it smells like bone, it must be bone. No, we have to be scientists. We have to be like our doctor colleagues. So the idea of, of regeneration, if we regenerate the hard tissue, I very rarely have to do soft tissue surgery. And I, I, you know, I'm doing a couple of cases, grafts a day, and I probably only do three or four soft tissue grafts a year. I let the host do it. As long as we are regenerating the hard tissue with true host bone, the host will regenerate with keratinized attached tissue. This is that same case. Four years later, I did one surgery. And that's all. And these are the benefits of the materials and the protocol. So you can see where the, the upper right, uh, the upper left foot, uh, five is. You can see we've got a little buckle defect. And there it is. Four years later, we've got four to five millimeters of new buckle bone. And that's what's keeping that soft tissue there. You only get keratinized at attached soft tissue by the host if you have true host bone uh, and the, the situation with the bleeding. I'll just show you another little case. I'm going to show the whole case later on. Minas can show it. This is one of Minas's cases. This is done in one surgery. That's only just after we loaded it. Uh, it's loaded six months now, and you can see on the CT at the bottom, that's six-month post-op CT. So it's six months post-op plus that I doubt there's probably one to two percent residual graft material. So we know by using bioabsorb materials that that's a new buckle plate. Now we look through this case, and we're going to just look at a straight sort of small little cyst, how to repair it. As you can see, we've lost bone, we've got a cyst, so we've lost a little bit of bone, a little defect to repair here, and we're going to just utilize host healing. Okay, so we're going to remove the cyst, and I'm just going to curate it out, and there it is at three weeks. Yes, we would lose a lot of profile if we left that. So I raised a site specific fact right according to the protocol. You can see the site there. I use degranulation burrs to clean it to this level. It's important that the site is properly cleaned just to improve the consistency of the outcome. Yeah, I'm not using guided here. I'm using the old style. Place the implant exactly where we want it. It's a restorative job. I'm not going to place it too politely. Others will make restoration more difficult. So I'm going to graft a little bit with a wetter mix of ethos palately, and then I'm going to place the implant. We're going to have very low primary. Don't worry, I often place with no or low primary. Low primary now often leads to, and all the research is showing, to higher secondary uh, ISQ. So this is not a problem in my eyes. It's bleeding a little bit too much, but again, it's not a problem. You can see the material is staying there. We then use a sterile gauze and a dry sterile gauze and just stabilize it. Get my nurse to hold it for three or four minutes. There it is. And it's stable. Okay. It doesn't have to be rock hard. The graft is stable because, as I showed you, the calcium sulfate and the, the BDTC particles interlock. Now we're going to restore the case at 11 weeks. And here it is loaded. Impressions are taken at 10 weeks, the pickup. And there it is just at loading. And it's it's a nice way because it's only one surgery and the patients feel comfortable about it. There it is, six months loaded on a scan. And you can see we've only got five or 6% residual graft material. So it's an adequate outcome for the host. So we've taken it from there to there. And that's a simple sort of way to keep it and make it easier. The less surgery we do on our patients, oddly enough, the happier they are, the happier they are, the happier we are. This is simple. Keep it easy. Here we're looking at just the two scans going through. 
And you see the importance of not placing the implant too politely makes it easier for me to restore. And now we've got five millimeters of buccal bone on the implant rather than the one millimeter. As you know, it only has about a millimeter or two in a lot of these cases in the aesthetic zone. So when we're talking about osteoinductivity, I know every time you go to a lecture in dentistry, the guys always say, oh, there's nothing osteoinductive but the host bone. Nonsense. There are, there are 200 high impact papers in journals, in medical journals. These are impact factor 10, 12. These are not dental journals. And they all say the same thing, that calcium phosphates are, have an osteoinductive potential. This is just a known factor in medicine. Don't understand where it came from in dentistry that, that somehow nothing was osteoinductive, barring or tugginous bone. This is a well-known factor. I don't know, you know, anyway, there you go, that's life. So when we look at it, this is in PNES, and this is possibly the most cited medical journal in the world, impact factor 10.5, I think, or something like that. Again, all they're talking about is osteoinductive ceramics, a synthetic alternative to autologous bone. This is what the doctors are talking. This is the future. And I've just seen a paper come out uh, in the last few days, and they are saying exactly the same. This time it's a dental paper, which is unusual. They've been looking around a little bit. So, yes, if we want a really good picture, if we want to put an x-ray up in my um, lecture and say, that looks, look at all the bone, look how good I am, I'd, st I'd throw a whole lot of HA in this heart. It gives a much better picture because it's white. But I don't think I really want that. What I want to do is see striations. I want to see true bone. I want to see bone growing there. And then I can assess it over a longer period of time without just seeing a big white blotch and saying, oh, how clever I am, I've done GBR. I prefer not to be clever and do true regeneration. And this is what, when we look at it, if we look at the, the one side, yes, there's a fair amount of bone in with the xenograft in there, but the xenograft particle is gonna stay there forever. And that's taking the place of host bone. Whereas when we look on the right hand side, those are the ethos particles. And if we look at it, can we see the bone growing into the particle? So eventually these particles will be replaced by host bone. This is what biology wants. And oddly enough, this is what our patient wants. So we go back to just a straightforward protocol case. This is run of the mill daily thing. You can see the number of ap apicectomies have been done on this case. So it's, it's sort of slightly distorted the hard, the soft tissue here. So there you go, three weeks healing, site specific, raise the flap, keep the adjacent papillae, not just because it makes it easier and less problems in the future, um, but we want to, it helps us retain that interproximal bone. Place the implant in the optimal position for the restoration. I don't, I try and place all my implants straight, keep them as simple as possible because in actual fact, placing the implant where the bone is often means you're placing the implant in the wrong place and it's a restorative job. Right, so you can see I've placed it. This is not a nice position for this uh, tree implant here. And, uh, you know, I just graft, never over graft. Unlike a lot of other graft materials, what we're doing here is we're regenerating, we're helping the host do the regeneration. So we need the periostin, we need the periostin to be close. We're not gonna put thick layers and, and, and hope we're gonna get a little bit. That's completely illogical when it comes to regeneration. That's a GBR process. We're talking about true regeneration. We want the body to do it for us. Therefore, don't overgraft the sites. Always leave the site to the optimal amount. And the, the, even if it's undergraft, it's gonna be better than overgrafting. Overgrafting doesn't mean more bone. Here it is 10 weeks later. And as you can see, we've got three to four millimeters new bone it's it's relatively new bone it's only 10 weeks it will model further under functional remodeling but you will find you'll get good hostile readings there it is up nice and close and here are the x-rays showing the case here it is loaded two years you can see yes there's a little bit of from the original uh, apicectomies but we've got a pili back we've got you know it's a reasonable outcome and that's two years loaded so when we've got a thicker case where you think, oh, I do need a little more bone, what do we do? Don't put more material, rather layer it. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a layering here done by Minas. And here we're just removing the tooth. You can see there's a small loss of keratinized tissue. So we've lost that, we've got a little phrenal pull. And as you can see by the probe, uh, or let's say, curate rather, we've lost the 
buckle bone. This is an important thing. These are the degranulation burrs, ethos has them as well. And, and it's all about cleaning the site properly, cleaning it really well. So here's that five week patient had to go away for something. So you can see, yes, because of the defect, uh, because of the, t the problems with the buckle defect, we've already lost the volume of the bone and we've lost the keratinized tissue. You can see where we've lost it. So we open it up, degranulate the site using the same principles that I've used for 17 years every day, a couple of times a day, and we graft with ethos. We don't overgraft it. We do not want to over, we, we regenerating, so we need less material. And at 10 weeks, we open it again. Yes, it's not ideal because it hasn't got a tooth coming out of it, um, but also we need a little more bone. This gives us an opportunity to take a core, which as I say, we want to find out what is there. We don't want to just look at it and say, oh, that's bone, because you can't just look at it. Or you can't look at it on an x-ray or look at it visually and say that's bone. You have to be scientific about it. This is very important. And then we place, we're using Versa, so we are densifying the new bone, which is nice because the new bone is very elastic, so it spreads a lot easier. Placing the implant, a little bit further graft, loaded 12 weeks. There it is, satisfactory outcome. Yeah, possibly a phrenectomy could have helped in this case. Ostel reading, we find we get higher uh, Ostel readings than if we place the implant in the adjacent bone. And we, we, you know, we think that this is due to a higher uh, calcification of the grafted bone sites. There it is, silver plug. I like to use silver plugs. They just help with uh, antibacterial effect in the screw holes. And that's the outcome. There it is there. Now we look at the, the cause. And what we're seeing again, as you can see, we're getting a nice over 50% new host bone. And if we look at the close-up on the right-hand side, we can see how the bone is growing into the particle of ethos. And this is going to achieve what we eventually want to achieve, and that is a higher percentage of true vital bone, because there won't be graft material taking the place of bone. Again, this is logical. Now, when we're grafting, another little problem, and the reason why a lot of people like using traditional membranes or whatever. And, and I think one of the problems why uh, there was always a problem with xenografts and why they originally started using membranes when using xenografts, micromotion. Micromotion, uh, as Shank pointed out many years ago, uh, can lead to fibrous tissue due to the mobility of the particles. If, they, if they're mobile, uh, the mesenchymal cells will differentiate a fibroblast rather than osteoblast. Also, if you're using a xenograft, there's a giant cell reaction. The host wants to encapsulate the particles. So if you're ever using a xenograft, you must use a membrane because the host is seeing it as a foreign body, wants to encapsulate it, and this is another reason for fibrous tissue. Now, when we look at our grafts, you can see, and we're looking at this situation, I'm gonna show you the effect. So this is another thing to always evaluate. Look at the effect on the muscle foot pull. Can you see it moving? The tissue, a simple phrenectomy, what have we got? We've now got a stable site. Again, so we must evaluate all our cases, especially the lower mandible. People always ask me about the lower mandible, and that's the hardest area to do because it's got all that muscular activity. As for the, the healing potential of calcium phos uh, sulfate in amongst the calcium phosphate, I think that helps a lot with the soft tissue. I often take the sutures out in 48 hours, two, three days, you can see using monofilament. Patients don't like the monofilament. It irritates them. So we take it out earlier. There it is, taken out of 48 hours. Here's the case one year later. It's adequate. You can see the photographs of the case, again, using material. You can see we are grafted in the third one along. You can see the early turnout, one year loaded. You can see how it's turned over to host bone. This is important because this is regeneration. Sure, you know, there's the, you could do GBR and you'd have a, a whiter picture, with, but it wouldn't be uh, true bone. It would be generally a foreign material in there. I really love these sutures now. Uh, PTFE, I'm using Korflon from Poland, fantastic. Uh, and I got introduced to them and I, I just love it. It makes my surgery and makes suturing a lot easier and the patients a lot happier. And here it is. Four days later, and you can see this was a one millimeter ridge, and you can already see how good and healthy that tissue is looking. There, the ridges before was one to two millimeters deeper down, but we had to actually, it was quite complicated. Uh, we had to split things. And do you see, I'm not over grafting. 
this is not about overgrafting. This is about regeneration. Yeah, if you want to have a nice big thick thing where you don't even know what's in there, yes, I could throw a whole layer of HA in there, throw probably piles of uh, xenografts. It would make it look thick, but it's not making bone. It's not making host bone. That's what we want the host to do. We, we, we want to work with host healing. So we look at it again. We're going to go through a thing. I think if being before, you'll have seen these. But this is recently published, end of last year. This is just a rabbit study. We did 20 rabbits, calvaria, 8 millimeter critical defects on the, on the uh, calvaria of the rabbit. There it is there. Um, at eight weeks in the rabbit, rabbits heal slightly faster. Yes, this is xenograft. Yes, it works very well. It's made something relatively hard. But the vast majority of the xenograft, it's not rabbit. Uh, again, if that's what you want, that works very well. This is autogenous, works very well. It's the gold standard. But what we do is we lose the volume, as you can see in this side. And this is where we've been achieving with ethos. And this is why we feel it's, it's different and we feel like we've made a little bit of progress in this area. Because what we've done is we've got 50% new rabbit bone. And we've got a nice stable and it looks a lot more similar to what we've achieved. And again, we see that when we look at micro CT. Here we're going through with the Zengraft. You can see, yes, it fills the hole basically, but there's very little host bone in there. When we look at the ethos, especially right in the center, and this is the area where we saw that it's osteoinductive and the osteoinductive potential you see right now. And then when we look at it here, same thing, grab it number five, you can see there's Xenograft and there's ethos. You can see the amount of new host bone. Again, this is in the research. It's all on um, PubMed, so you can just Google it. And when we look at the histology, you can see the difference between the ethos, where we've got 50% new bone at eight weeks, whereas in the xenograft, we've got, you know, I think in this particular side was about five or 10%. So they different things. One, we're using a filler, and the host is trying to heal around the filler, and the other, we're actually helping the host up upgrade the reg uh, regeneration, upregulate it. And again, in these studies, again on, on PubMed, you can see as the graft area goes away, the osteoid area improves, and this is what we want. These are just other research showing that the most important and the most osteoinductive of the calcium phosphates are the beta TCPs, and this is done by uh, Pam Mahalovich. And again, there's not that much research in xenografts because in, in medical research, well, because they don't use them. So we can't really find a lot, unfortunately. Marshall Uris, hero who discovered BMPs and osteoinduction and osteo uh, and, and uh, you know osteogenesis. So he was the, the the man who discovered all how bone actually heals. Our own studies for osteoinductivity, yes, we're doing pilot studies at the moment. We're just about to start a, a new full study growing bone in the leg of rabbits, which is, I don't think has been done before. They're normally using rats or even bigger animals like goats and dogs. Um, and here we can see only with ethos, uh, what we're noticing in all materials we used, we're seeing osteoid growing up adjacent to the particles. Final little bit of, uh, before we show a couple more clinical cases, host factors, really important thing. I think it's more important that we learn a little more about this. Uh, and, and this is the reason why implants fail. Implants don't fail, the host tissues fail. And, and this is something we need to understand more. I think Al Albregson said 2.5% uh, of our patients will lead to 50% of our failures. And that's the research they published on that. So we've got to understand about the physiology and the host, uh, a host healing and a host response. So now we look at a couple of cases, another one, nice one. Minas does record them really nicely. So. Um, here we've just had a problem with a, a fraction root. Uh, we've had to take it out. You can see there's three to four weeks of healing, and we're going to place the implant. Okay, and it's and again we're just using this to get the implant in the optimal position. We don't want the implant too palatally. I know a lot of people say, "Oh, stick the implant very far palatally," that creates problems. We can now realize we can help the host regenerate bone. What we're going to do in this case is we're going to remove, and this is a debate I had extensively a few years ago uh, with Maurice Salama. Uh, and the reason why we remove the bundle bone is if we don't remove that bundle bone, the host will. Once the tooth's been taken out and the PDL's been removed and we raise it flat, that bone is dead. It's going to need osteoclastic activity and macrophage activity to remove it. So if I remove it, it'll improve the aesthetic outcome long term. 
because we won't have the situation where we'll have osteoclasts removing part of it and could compromise the aesthetic. I know these are uh, unusual thoughts, but these are what we're looking at. This is what we're doing. Here's showing what we're doing. Again, so we use ethos, not too much. Don't overgraft the site. This was loaded at 12 weeks. And we had very high OSTA, I think 78 on this one. This is a penguin. This is not OSTA. So you can reuse the pegs, which is a good, and it's half the price to buy. So it's, uh, it's interesting, same principles. And there we fitted the abutment. And here it is, cases loaded. That's one year loaded. So you can see we've got an adequate outcome. And there's it scanned at one year. And you can see we've regenerated a new, the host has regenerated a new buckle plate. And here it is at one and a half years. So you can see it's got no HA, probably got no graft material there at all. What it's got is host bone in function. And that's why we're maintaining the profile and why we're maintaining the aesthetics of the case. This case is published as well um, in the EDI journal. And again, it'll be on the ETHOS site. So what about multi-units? Yeah, I use the same multi-units, full arches, whatever. I place the implants where I want the implants. Yes, there's defects here. So what? We're going to regenerate the bone. We're going to help the host regenerate the bone. I don't want to put the implants in the wrong place by putting them where the bone is if I can help the regenerate the bone in a very quick period of time. So here we have, we have the stabilized. You can see stabilized ethos. And there it is at 10 weeks. You can see the site is healthy with very pink healed tissue. Raised a flap to show because the, op the problem with using ethos is a lot of time your implants become covered in bone. So we needed a secondary surgery to access the implants and take the osteal readings. Here it is, one year loaded. All right, and there's the x-rays, all looking adequate. I'm going to show you this case because this is an unusual one. Um, same protocol, same case, just daily routine in and out thing. ISQ48 at the, at the taking of uh, the initial period, grafting it there. The difference with this guy is he had to go uh, to the United States and he needed to go at six weeks. So we had to restore this at six weeks. Now, six weeks is a very short period when we're used to six months and four months and whatever. But this is to show you, and this is how orthopedics work and the reason why people are not lying in their hospital beds and all in Switzerland for six months. Physiology is a lot faster and regeneration is a lot quicker than we think as long as we let the body heal. In other words, as long as we let the periosteum, as long as we let the healing process occur. So here it is raised at six weeks. And as you can see, we've got a new buccal plate. And yeah, the bone is quite new at six weeks, probably a lot of osteoid, but we've got now 68. So that shows, we've gone from 48 to 68. That shows that there's an integration, improved integration of the implant. Here that same case is loaded at 18 months. So it's adequate, it's worked. and. Uh, um, here you can see the problem. We've got internal resorption. Place the implant. Guess what? He comes back a couple of years later. Now he's got internal resorption on the adjacent tooth. So when I raise the flap, the site's been grafted three years ago, and you can see the new bone site. You can see the regeneration, and you can see bone particles in the shape. The bone is regenerating in the shape of the existing particles, and we. This is what we see histo histologically and histomorphometrically, and I'll show you that later. So when we look at a, another case um, uh, here, we've got an upper, upper right six, and uh, you can see the mesiobuckle, distal buckle defects, the palatal root, um, and we're going to have a little bit of bone loss here. So we're going to have to do an internal sinus lift. I was just going to use DASC on this, and we're placing the implant. Now, I'm not placing the implant all the way in. I'm actually placing the implant to a level, and now I'm going to build the implant the bone level, the new bone, up to the implant as well. So this helps me get a better platform for the restoration. Again, implant dentistry is a restorative job. We've always got to keep that in mind. So again, I haven't overgrafted. I've just done enough, stabilized the graft. There it is there. And here it is at nine months loaded. Okay, I had to take a scan at nine months because we're going to work on the sinus on the opposite side in the UK, it's very complicated. You have to have a clinical, a very good clinical reason for taking a scan, not, oh, I wanna have a look and see how my case is doing. And when we look at it here, you can see the new host regenerated, you can see the palatal side. So now this is nine months loaded plus the, the earlier. I doubt there's any residual graft material. If, if there is, it's probably one or 2% left. 
Have we needed to put HA in there? No, look at it, it looks fantastic. Have, look, even look at that palatal bone, look at the, the new uh, cortical plate on the, on the palatal side. I mean, that's, uh, you know, this is about using biology to do the work. I go to the beach, the body fixes the bone for me. It makes a lot of sense to me, because I like going to the beach, by the way. And if we look at it going through, you can see the effect even on the palate. You can see how it's bulging out. And this is all new bone regenerated, new buccal plate. Looking deeper down, we can see into the sinus. Yes, sure, when you look at a, this is an 18-year-old xenograft case, and it actually looked all right. But look at that lump on the outside. That's not regeneration. That's not true bone regeneration. That's guided bone regeneration. That's actually just filling a space with something that's solid that's going to help hold the tissue from it. That's not necessarily what I feel what we need. So, you know, that's more like an integration process. And, and yes, the materials do stay. You've got Albertson research, 11 years. There was hardly in, if any, resorption. But that's what they meant to do. These xenographs are meant to stay there for a reason because they're holding the profile. But issues can happen. You know, it's been seen that the, the ability of the bone to turn over may be impeded, and this may lead to issues as published here by Michael Norton. So when we look at histomorphology, this is done by Heinrich Nagurski and Ed Linder of uh, uh, Freiburg University. It allows us to assess the amounts of the volume of the material, what we have in the core. So it gives us the true assessment of what we have in that hard lump. And again, if we look at them closely here, we can see literally the bone growing into the particle, the new bone formation. We can see the cellular activity on the margin, turning the particle over to a bone particle. And it's often in the shape of the original particle, which we saw. So when we look at and we compare to a similar study, this other study was just done over a longer period of time, but again, using the same histologists. And we can see the difference when we look at it histomorphometrically, if we look on the left-hand side, the green is the bovine bone and the red is the new bone, whereas when we look on the right-hand side, the blue is the uh, synthetic and the red is the new bone. Of course, we're going to have a lot more. This is logical. We're going to have a lot more host bone. And this is the key, is about getting as much vital host bone as we can. And this has always been the key of the protocol right from when I started 17 years ago doing this and it's nice to be able to develop materials specifically for this protocol right we're getting near the end now and, and and this is a case i did 24 years ago and it was a bit of a tight squeeze back in those days we did that you know we could just look at cases eyeball them take a pilot squeeze a little bit thing in here and there and and uh, even with placing implants like this, which were much more difficult, the style of implant. Uh, it's lost no bone over 24 years. The guy loves it, loves his tooth, no problems whatsoever. But it, it was quite a delicate procedure. So nowadays, we like to use a lot of guided. And, uh, you know, um, I mean, in this particular case, I, we actually did use Blue M as well. I don't know if anyone knows Blue M. It's a product which is used uh, essentially to oxygenate tissue in post-operative care. I should have put something up of us using it. But I often use it in surgical sites as well. So it's just an interesting area. Look at a chemical to oxygenate the site. Again, working with host healing. Now, when we look at this particular case, uh, this lady was referred into. She wasn't exactly, she wasn't quite happy with her implants that she'd had it done a few years before. And yeah, they probably paced too wide an implant in the aesthetic zone. And I think the case was done immediate. This can be a problem with immediate is long term. It, it, sometimes you lose control of the thin buckle plate that you left with immediates. And this is why there's a lot of work on PET at the moment, which can help that. But it's a little bit of a, in my eyes, a complex surgical procedure. So we're going to go through this case. And here we're going to use guided. And we're going to use Peltop guided. Uh, I like the idea because the, the basically all this, the, the, the online, I mean, all the digital work is done by someone else for me. So you can see we've got a small defect and we're going to get the implant and the guides made and the designs made all uh, out, out of house at the implant company. So we get everything back. We get sleeved guides and a special guide system 
when we're doing guided, I always prefer to have sleep guides and, and a correct system. There's too much air, room for error otherwise. And as you can see, we've got a really nice, well-made guide. And here's the thing. So we're going to raise the flap because we know there's a defect. We're following the same protocol, the protocol I've used since 17 years. And we're going to place it now using a guided system. And that's the, the big difference in this case. There you go. We've placed it. We've got a pelt top uh, advanced here with internal hex. And we're going to graft it like we normally do. So we're just going to graft it, suture it closed. When you suture it closed, always start at the papillae, and you can leave it a little open at the palate. I forgot about you know, that aspect about uh, flap uh, design. And there it is there. So when I was talking about flap design, keep the minimal, keep the adjacent papillae. Don't raise a big flap unless you don't like the patient that much. Um, and then when we're raising from the palate or the lingual side, start the flap. You can start with a split thickness going to a full thickness so that when you start suturing, you can suture tension free. Because we're not putting 15 different products in and five membranes, it's much easier to close. And it's also much easier to have tension free. If there's a space, leave it on the palate, leave it on the lingual side, and it'll heal by secondary intention. So don't worry about that. And here it is, ready to load at 10 weeks. And again, we've got an adequate outcome. This is just at fitting. It was just the other day. So, yeah, I don't have Photoshop. And, uh, you know, I think things will improve a little bit now. But you can see immediately, you can see the effects that if we've got hard tissue underneath, we will have this nice keratinized soft tissue. So it's simple. Okay, the tooth next door is still not looking ideal. When we look at the scans, you can see right on the, on the left-hand side of the scans of the new bone area, area and uh, um, we've now got a new nice three, four millimeter thick buckle plate, whereas that's the one on the other side, and you can see where the implant, the implant's too thick, too buckle, and this is where the problems occurred. And you can just look at the x-ray there, and everything seems fine. So um, that's about it, and it takes us right up to the hour, but a few questions. So thanks a lot, everyone, on the webinar. And uh, what I'll do is I'll hand back to Pete, and uh, we've got sort of five minutes probably, and you can run through any questions with it, and I can go into those. Okay, now if anyone else well, also wants to contact us, just that's my web address. Visit us at ethos.com, and also visit the Facebook site, Ethos Case Studies. Thank you. Great, thank you for that, Peter. Um, we have got a few questions in, so I'll just run through them quickly now. Um, the first one is regarding using ethos in perio procedures, if you've got any experience of that and any comments on uh, how it works in perio procedures. Yeah, you know, again, this is a, probably another whole lecture, and I did it at Zurich University in the a perio conference there. Um, essentially, uh, the whole thing with, the good thing about with perio here is, again, we've got an osteoinductive material that fully bioabsorbs, so it gives us a true picture. Um, the way I like to do big perio cases is I often get cases that are referred for all on four. I, I keep them and I've got 10 year case studies where they have all their own individual teeth. So what I do is take out the worst perio teeth, splint them together, place implants in between and regenerate uh, the bone. And I, I haven't put those in because that wasn't the topic of, of the lecture tonight. But yes, we can get three to four millimeters vertical bone on adjacent perio teeth and stabilize them. Now, this is a combination of splinting, combination of regeneration of new host bone and using implants to help stabilize the occlusal forces later. So it's a, it's a complex area. But yeah, you know, it's something we, we do do. And um, we've got a similar question as well, Peter, but focusing on sinus grafts and sinus lifts, if you've got yeah. uh, any thoughts on ethos in that setting. Well, yeah, again, I, I published a lot on there. I always load at eight weeks because, again, because we've got an osteoinductive potential in the material. Uh, if I showed you, I could show you cases where I've re-raised the flap on the window. I use DAST mostly on lateral windows. Uh, and it's completely closed with new host bone at eight weeks. And in the cases I've raised, look, it might vary from person to person because physiology is a variation. Um, again, the good thing about inner sinus is you creating host bone. People say, yes, it might renumatize. But if you've got an implant in there, again, the function keeps it. This is the whole thing as dentists. We feel we need HA to get a good picture or we need HA to hold the, the lining up. 
We don't. Otherwise, we would need HA in our, uh, you know, foreign HA to hold our skeletons when we stand up. You've got to remember that function maintains the bone, and that's the whole thing about it. So, yeah, I use, I do have two sinuses a week, probably every week. I've been doing them for 20 odd years. And with DASC and, and systems like that, it's really made it predictable, safe, and, and we, we often place and the implants and load them in eight weeks in one millimeter of, of residual bone because the bone underneath is going to be better quality bone. So the bone in the sinus is going to be of a higher quality when you're using osteoinduct to fully resorb materials. Yes, if you're putting it into a xenograft, well, you don't really know what you've got in there. It just looks white on the x-ray. So it makes a lot of sense to me uh, sinus-wise. Sorry, Peter. Peter, we've had quite a few other questions come well, in. Uh, so I think okay. we'll uh, try to get through as many as we can. Um, yeah, sure. In the case you showed when you remove the bundle bone, um, do you keep that uh, material to place it back as a particulate? Um, because obviously um, many dentists um, would say that's the best type of material yeah, you could use. Yeah, you yeah, they, you know, they can do that if they want to. We don't do it. It goes in the bin. Uh, but, you know, it, because we know from uh, doing it a lot in the past that, that the host has got to remove that bone. Uh, and, and I know a lot of people have said there's a lot of good things in the dead bone. Well, to me, it's dead bone. The body wants to get rid of it. I'm looking at an osteogenic process and forwards rather than osteoclastic sort of removal of the rubbish. Um, so it's, it's, I know it's a difficult concept to grasp, but that's, that's the way we've done That's the way we've done it for 17 years. Seems fine. Um, but it's, it's just a thought. Yeah. Another question. Would you recommend to apply ethos post extraction to sites with the intention of future implant placement? Yes, again, but you've got to be careful. You know, people talk about socket grafting, which we, we're inferring to here. And, and socket grafting is possibly the hardest thing to do in implant dentistry uh, because people don't clean the site. There's the patients are not nice. There's a messy situation. There's gravity. I could show you everything we got on soccer. We're publishing a new protocol where I like a, 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 a three, four week healing period, then rather raise the flap, then clean the site properly and then regraft it. And you'll be surprised how you, you then can have a nice bony area to place the implant in. Yeah. Um, another one here. I think we've got time for two more. Um, can yep. I use ethos with the SCA kit? Uh, that's the internal for an internal sinus lift. Yeah, I do that all the time. Um, I would say, as I say, I do two a week. Probably one of them's internal, one of them's lateral every week. It's very easy to do. Uh, a couple of people are using them with Versa at the moment. It, it's difficult because Versa probably relies more on, on not on regeneration, but on a, a, a collagenous sort of mush to help hold and push. Uh, but if you've got the skillet, you'll get a higher percentage of bone. That's without a doubt. So, you know, we, I use internal a lot. I use the internal desk as well. Cool. Just one more question. Um, sure. When you're using ethos and you're covering the implant with the material, do you prefer a more aggressive or passive implant placement? Uh, how do you mean aggressive? I prefer passive. Uh, you know, my philosophy, and I've got another whole lecture on that, is I actually don't, and as you know, we can push implants in with no bone to implant contact and no primary stability. And we get a higher secondary stability on those than an adjacent one placed in the bone. So there's a lot of new questions. And, you know, we, that's why we're always having to do research is to find answers, because we're looking at we're looking at things in a slightly different way. We're looking at it in a slightly more biologic, uh, more medical way rather than. Uh, a more mechanical approach. So it's an interesting area. Um, I, no, I I don't aggressively place implants, whatever that means. No. So well, I'm a that's little the, confused that's by that. I think all the time we've got, Peter. So uh, thank yeah, thank I you. I mean, very anyone much. can email me and or email you at uh, edethos.com. Perfect. Thank you very much, everybody, well, for coming on the webinar this evening. Um, there will be a link sent round so you can view a recording of the webinar if you like at a later date. And we'll, um, we'll be in touch with details of our future educational activities. So thank you very much. Good evening. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good evening. Bye.